He is a voice shouting in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. The valleys will be filled and the mountains and hills made level. The curves will be straightened and the rough places made smooth. And then all the people will see the salvation sent from God. Welcome. Well, I tell you, this is the most exciting season uh, of the year with Christmas coming up and Advent. And we're so glad that you're here today. And we're looking forward to next Sunday, uh, our communion service, our Christmas at communion next Sunday. Our candle lighting services will be on Monday and Tuesday. And there's all kinds of flyers and information there in your worship folder. But, but you just don't want to miss the Christmas music, your favorite carols with a little Edge Church twist on it. And it's just going to be fantastic. So we're looking forward to that over the next week and uh, seeing all that God does. And we started a series called Kingmaker last week because John the Baptist was the, the kingmaker of Jesus, if you want to use that term. Uh, John did not make Jesus king, but he did prepare the way for the coming of the king. And uh, the term kingmaker in our culture refers to people who are behind the scenes that are setting others up for success i.e. John the Baptist, preparing the way for Jesus Christ. Now, we live in a culture that loves to take selfies. I mean, selfies are everywhere. You guys know what I'm talking about when I say selfies. You know, it's where you hold up that, that camera with that perfect eye angle and you take that picture and then you post it on your favorite social media site. We love to take selfies. And this week, even President Obama was taking some selfies. He was there with a couple of heads of state, you know, taking his picture. And uh, not only the president, but, you know, babies are taking selfies. Can you believe that? <laughs> you know, if you're that cute, you should take a selfie, right? Everywhere we turn, people are taking selfies. The Pope, Times Man of the Year, he's taking a selfie. Here he is with some teenagers. The Pope. And animals, animals are taking <laughs> selfies. How did they do that? I'm telling you, there's some clever animals. I don't even know what kind of animal that is, but some smart animals. Some of our church members are taking selfies. This is Quentin Frank. <laughs> Parents, don't be afraid. Quentin is one of our student ministry leaders, but we did do a background check on him, okay? So don't be intimidated. I think my favorite selfie is this one of Kaylee Hill and her friends. She's a college student in Omaha, Nebraska who decided to do a video selfie of her and her friends running onto the field during the middle of the College World Series. And you notice there she's about to be decked by three security guards. She didn't even care. She's like smiling like she's about to be pounded to the ground, you know. Whoa! What is wrong with all of these selfies? I tell you what. We, we live in a selfie culture, and because we do, I think I want to take a selfie. Do you guys mind if I just take a quick selfie real quick? Let's just do this. I want the whole world to know that I spoke at Edge Church today. Let me just get this dialed up. And you guys got to do something fun, okay? You guys got to make this look cool because if you just sit there. Okay, here we go. Now, I need this whole, I need everybody just to stand up, man, cheer, clap, do something fun, you know, something exciting. Please look like you're enjoying this, okay? Ooh, that was fun. I'm going to do another one. Come over here. Oh, my goodness. Artistic angle. That was awesome. All right. Thanks for letting me do that, right? Trying to rival everybody else. You know, we, we, we live in a selfie culture, don't we? A lot of times we're asking selfie questions like, well, what do I want to do? And how do I feel? And what are my rights? And, 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 and what do I think about that? And, and, and I think one of the, the saddest commentaries of our culture is, is our own self-indulgence driven by pride and, and driven by our own selfishness. God wants us to begin to, to learn 
the virtue of humility. Today I want to talk to you about humility, and this is kind of one of those topics that people don't just love to talk about. What did you learn about at church today? We talked about humility. Oh man, I am so sorry, you know. <clears throat> and you have a conference about being successful or about being blessed in life and and about reaching and achieving your dreams and goals, man, you'll pack the place out. You're like, no, we're going to have a conference about humility. You know, you'll have like three people that show up, right? You write a book about humility, no one will buy it. But yet it is something that is so important. And the secular world does not value the virtue of humility. In fact, the world tells us we should be uh, self-indulgent, we should be prideful, we should be uh, opinionated, we should be aggressive and dominant and do our own thing and whatever it may be. Humility really is a virtue that comes from Jesus Christ. It's a virtue that comes from the Christian faith. It's something that's different. It, it's, it's a voice that we hear today from the Word of God that is different from the message we're hearing from our culture, but it is something that is so powerful. And could you imagine how much better that the world would be if we just had a little more humility can you imagine how, how many more marriages, how many more husbands and wives would get along if, if there was a little more humility in the home? C could you imagine in the workplace how, how many more people could get along, coworker with coworker, if there was just a little bit more humility? Could you just imagine how the world would be if we were a little bit less concerned about us and a little more concerned about God and about others? It would be a different place, wouldn't it? It would be a very different place. The world would be a much better place. I, I believe so many addictions would be broken. You know, at, at the root of addiction is, is this attitude that says, I don't want anyone to help me. I can do this on my own. Maybe some of us are facing that today. We're, we're sucked into that addiction, and, and, and we are filled with pride. And pride is the thing that is, is, is leading us to say, I don't need any help. If we would begin to humble ourselves... How would that begin to change? No, no person in the scripture exemplifies humility more than Jesus Christ. We, we've been in this series about John the Baptist. John the Baptist is so important because he prepares the way for Jesus. And not only was Jesus humble, John the Baptist, uh, Jesus said he was the greatest person born among women. I mean, he was the, the, the greatest individual, the greatest person Jesus had ever known. His humility is unbelievable. And we're going to see this morning how John the Baptist's life began to be more about Jesus and less about himself. And I want to share with you these three things today to help us begin to understand and to download how we can live a life of humility in the spirit of Christ. You know, as we prepare for the season of Christmas and Advent, we need to think more of Christ and a little bit less of ourselves, don't we? A little bit less about ourselves, more about Christ. And we see that from John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was born. He had two parents. He had a dad named Zechariah who was a priest, and he had a mom named Elizabeth. And Zechariah and Elizabeth were not able to have children. The Bible says that Elizabeth was barren. She was a really, really old lady. And one day, Zechariah, who was a priest, was in the house of worship offering some incense to the Lord. And Gabriel, this angel, shows up on the scene. Now, Gabriel is like the LeBron James of angels, okay? And he shows up and he's like, you're going to have a son and you're going to call him John. And, 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 and the father is, is, is a man of God. He's a priest, but, you know, his wife is really old. And he does not believe what the angel of the Lord is telling him. He's like, man, you got to be kidding. I mean, that is not humanly, humanly possible, Zechariah said. And because of his unbelief, Gabriel said to him, you're not going to be able to talk until the day that you have your child. And so Elizabeth, Elizabeth, the mom, is doubly blessed. She is <laughs> pregnant. Everybody's like, I know where he's going with that. <laughs> she is pregnant with a child she has always wanted to have, and her husband cannot argue with her. <laughs> right? You're like, life is awesome. <laughs> you know, in the Hebrew world, children were seen as a blessing from the Lord. In modern times, a lot of people see children kind of as, you know, something that costs a lot of money or 
impedes my career or you know, is, is something that you put off as long as possible if you just have to have kids. In the Hebrew world, it was all about children. It was all about kids. Kids were seen as a blessing from God. And Elizabeth had not had that joy. She had been barren all of these years. Now, all of a sudden, John the Baptist has been conceived. And he's going to turn out to be this great prophet. The Israelites had not heard a word from God from a prophet in 400 years until John the Baptist came on the scene. And, and his whole life, we're going to see, was, was there to prepare the way for Jesus Christ. To prepare the way. To get things ready, to get things set up. Jesus' public ministry began at the age of 30. John the Baptist was working beforehand to help Jesus get off to a great start. Many of the disciples of John the Baptist became the disciples of Jesus. John the Baptist was setting it all up, getting it, getting it all ready. Let's notice these three things about this man who understood humility so well. The Bible tells us, first of all, we should celebrate when the team wins. We should celebrate when the team wins. Now you notice in John chapter 3, a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And verse 26 says, And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, who, is, who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing... And all are going to him. And John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. So the disciples of John the Baptist are like, John, that guy that you kind of like, you know, baptized the other day and, you know, you kind of put your stamp of approval, he's baptizing more people than we are. What's the problem, John? Who is this guy? I mean, he's doing bigger and greater things than we are. And John the Baptist is like, that was the goal. <laughs> That's what we've been trying to accomplish. We've been successful, right? The disciples of John the Baptist thought this whole thing, this whole thing was, was really about them and not about, about Jesus. They begin to get kind of confused. You know, sometimes we can live with that spirit that spirit of competition, spirit of competition that is never satisfied. I've got to have more than the other person. I've always got to outdo somebody else. I have to be envious of people when they have more than I do. I have to compare. I have to contrast. I have to put people down when they succeed. And John says, no. He says, this, this is the will of God. Look at that last phrase there in verse 27. A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. John's like, God is at work. Do not get in the way of what God is doing. Sometimes we can develop that, that jealous, critical spirit. It might be in the office when somebody else makes more sales or gets a promotion and we don't. A spirit of competition. Sometimes, sometimes it can even be in the church. Sometimes people are like, well, that church is bigger than this church. You know, well, what? And, and, and sometimes we have this temptation to discredit people who are successful. Like, if you succeed, you've done something wrong, right? You're, like, bad if, you, if you're blessed, you know, or, like, if something good happens in your life. We have to check our motivations. We have to check our hearts. John begins to redirect his disciples. He begins to say, guys, listen, this is of God. This is, this is, this is good. Now, some people thought that John was the Christ, they thought John the Baptist was the Christ. John could have had a great life. He could have said, man, I'm the man. I'm Jesus. Come and worship me. Oh, no. He had his stuff together. He realized that it was not a competition. He realized that we should celebrate when the team wins. Now, I love the NFL, but the NFL is very self-indulgent. I mean, have you guys seen some of these end zone celebrations? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It's like, look at me, wow. I keep waiting for one of those players to pull out a phone and not to make a call, but to take a selfie, right, in the end zone. <laughs> That'd be great. Somebody's got to do that. It's great drama. It's fun to watch on TV, isn't it? Everybody's like, wow, all those end zone celebrations. Man, I'm telling you, somebody's, it's amazing. If I tried to do that, I'd hurt myself. 
I think the kingdom of God, though, is, is a little bit less like the NFL and a more, more like the Olympics. When you watch the Olympics, it's all about Team USA, right? And Team USA got second, fourth, and sixth in the long jump. And they put up that little grid that says... Team USA, team medals. We have this many gold medals and this many silver medals and this many bronze medals and this many total medals. It's all about the team. It's about Team USA. The kingdom of God is much more like Team USA than it is about end zone celebration. So we should celebrate when people are blessed. We should be excited when people succeed, we, we should be encouraging and affirming, not negative and demeaning when we see people that are doing good. It should be true in the church and it should be true in our personal lives. The root of this is insecurity and pride. When we have insecurity and pride in our lives, we cannot celebrate when other people do well. But John redirects, he redirects the disciples. And, uh, you know, a great Christian is like a great point guard. Now, i got to talk about basketball. It's really basketball season now, isn't it? Football's kind of, you know, fading away for a little bit. Let's talk about basketball. A great basketball team, a championship-winning team, has a great point guard. And a point guard, let's say in the NBA or even in college basketball, a great point guard usually does not score all the points on the team. In fact, the leading scorer is usually not the point guard. Why? Because the point guard's job, even though he has the ball more than anybody else, his job is to distribute the ball to everybody else. And so he knows that the small forward likes to take these shots and the post-up players down around the basket, they like to take these shots, and so I need to get the guys the ball this way and, and this way. The point guard is a distributor. The point guard is, is, is one who is assisting the team. And, and a championship winning team has a great point guard. But listen, if your point guard scores all the points, you have a ball hog, right? And you won't win any championships. We should be more concerned with assisting others, assisting God, assisting the team, doing what the team needs to win than we do about anything else. And when we succeed, we need to also make sure that we don't brag. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 3 enlightens us a little more here. It says, for when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, and, and, and you, uh, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. So when you succeed, you don't brag. When you succeed, that time when you get a raise, you don't have to go tell everybody. Just be humble. Don't do that. Sometimes we do the humble brag thing. You guys know what that is? The humble brag is like when we say, man, I am so tired. I am so worn out. I lost 20 pounds in one week. Hashtag glory to God. you got to get that glory to God in there, right? <laughs> Hashtag glory to God. It's when you're subtly letting people know how fantastic your life is by kind of throwing in a little woe is me, the humble brag. It's not really humble. The Bible tells us, let's focus on the team. And when we focus on the team, we will begin to play our part. Now, God has a part. For every person, every individual plays a different position, plays a different part. John the Baptist illustrates this from a scene of, in a wedding. And notice what he says in verse 29. At the wedding, the groom is the one who gets married. The best man is glad just to be there and to hear the groom's voice. That's why I'm so glad. What's John talking about? Well, the scripture tells us that the bride of Christ is the church and that Jesus is the bridegroom, or the groom. And John says, I'm just an attendant at the wedding. In other words, the focus is not on me. Now, would it be weird if you went to a wedding and you looked over and one of the groomsmen 
had on a different color tux from everybody else. Everybody had black on and he had on a yellow tux. It'd be kind of strange, right? Everybody would be looking at the bumblebee attendant, wouldn't they? They wouldn't be looking at the bride. When you go to a wedding, the most beautiful person in the room is to be the bride. And if you're going to look at everybody else, you've got to look at the groom. But you're not there to look at the bridesmaids, right? That's why they all look the same. That's why they all have the same dress on. I do weddings from time to time. The focus is on the bride and the groom. It's not even on the minister. It really is on the bride and the groom. A great wedding is when you leave and you're like, the bride was so beautiful. That's a successful wedding. And you know, the attendant's job is not to draw attention. It's just there to, be, to support the bride and the groom. So the groom's and what's he supposed to do? Man, he's supposed to make sure, first of all, he can hang on to the ring. You know, you don't want to lose the ring. And, and then, then you want to serve the groom. And uh, you're there to make the groom look good. I mean, you're there to return tuxedos and plan parties and, and, and organize things. But your job is not to be seen. I mean, it would be weird if you went to the reception of the wedding and the best man wanted to dance all night with the bride. It would just be strange. It would be weird. Somebody, you would say, somebody doesn't know their part. Somebody doesn't know their place, what they're supposed to be doing. John says, I'm just an attendant. I'm just standing over here, and I'm watching the church, and I'm watching Jesus, and I'm so satisfied. And look, look at this again. He says this. I'm just so glad to be there and to hear the groom's voice. You know, when you, when you see somebody get married, it's just fun to be there. You're like, how sweet is this? Especially if it's a committed Christian couple. They love each other, and they're going to spend their lives together, and everybody gets that warm, fuzzy feeling and emotion, you know, at a wedding, and it's just good, and you just celebrate. John says, I'm just glad to be there. I'm just glad to help. I, I know what my part is on the team. I I know, I know what I'm supposed to do. So we should be looking at Jesus and the church, the bride and the groom, not just our own stuff. And we got to use whatever platform that God gives us to bring attention to the bridegroom. That's what we ought to do. And God's given every person here a platform. Do you know that? You have a platform at work, you have a platform in the neighborhood, you have a platform in the community, you, you have a platform uh, in whatever you're involved in in life, and God wants you to use that platform to draw attention to the groom, to Jesus, not to draw attention to yourself. John says, I'm just standing in the background. I'm just in the shadows of Jesus. I'm just there kind of helping out where needed, but... But it is all about him. You know, one of our church members has brought um, about 10 or 15 friends in the last few weeks to church. And he works over at Buckley, and, and he's a recruiter over there. And, you know, he's brought, he brought almost his whole office to church. And then he's bringing the people he's recruiting to come into the military. They're coming too. It's awesome to see. God's given him a platform. And he's taking that platform... And he's pointing people to the bridegroom. That's what God wants us to do. God wants us to be about using whatever influence that we have, whatever opportunities we have, to point people to the main thing, right? The main thing. So we've got to play our part. And listen, this is part of humility. I mean, if you are not a humble person, you're not going to point people to Jesus because you're always worried about yourself. Well, what do people think about me? You know, validation is not a bad thing, but, but needing to be validated all the time is totally dysfunctional, right? If you have to always be told that you're okay, you know, let me give you a hug and a pat on the back. There's a problem, right? It's all about me. The moment you quit worrying about you and you start worrying about the bridegroom, there's the moment that God's going to do something awesome in your life. Play your part. Here's the third thing. Make a bigger deal about Jesus. You want to be humble? Make a bigger deal about Jesus. You may be thinking, man, I need to be more humble, but I don't know what to do. Here's a great place to start. Make a bigger deal about Jesus. The last thing that John said in John 3.30 is this. 
He must increase, but I must decrease. That should be the motto of the Christian experience, right? Because it's all about him. It's not about me. And sometimes people come and they say, the only thing that I can do in the church is get up on stage and sing solos, you know? When we have the spirit of humility, we're willing to do whatever is needed on the team. Man, you need me to clean bathrooms? I'll clean bathrooms. You need me to sing? I'll sing. You need me to go shake hands and hold babies, change diapers? I'll do that. that that's the mark of humility. It really is. It's the mark of spiritual maturity. Because, again, it's less about me. I need to decrease, and he needs to increase. And the more that you begin to lift Jesus up in your life, the more that it will bring humility in your own experience. Now, people say, what is humility? I mean, humility, what, what does that mean? Does that mean that I wear a white shirt and black dockers and drive a used Pinto, you know? Is that humility? Humility does not mean that you don't have goals in your life. It doesn't mean you're not successful. It doesn't mean that you're not wealthy. Sometimes people think, well, you have to be poor to be humble. Not necessarily the case. I have to be a failure to be humble. No, not at all. In fact, in 1 Peter, the Bible tells us that if we will humble ourselves, that God will lift us up. You see, the way up is down. When you begin to exalt Jesus in your life, then Jesus will begin to build you up. People say, I wish I was more confident. Make a bigger deal about Jesus because the more that Jesus is moving and working in your life, the more confident that you will become because you realize that it's not all about you. And humble people are attractive people. People want to be friends with humble people. People want to work with humble people. Again, our culture doesn't necessarily elevate this virtue, but we're so drawn to it. And we're so repelled by pride and arrogance, are we not? John says, he must increase and I must de decrease. Sometimes we think nothing is good enough. You know, I need to be validated. You have to be strong to be humble. John the Baptist was a man's man. I, last week I talked about his diet. He ate locusts and wild honey. Can you see him sticking his hand into a beehive, you know, to grab some honey? This is a man's man. This is not some weak little scrawny dude. I mean, I can't imagine how miserable that it would be to wear camel's hair. That just makes me itch all over thinking about it. That sounds worse than wool, you know? It's like, Wah. John the Baptist living in the desert. He had more hair than an episode of Duck Dynasty, you know? <laughs> I mean, John the Baptist was a dude. But you know what he said? He said, I need to decrease and he needs to increase. That's what we ought to do. You look at John chapter 1. John's humility, he says this, this in verse 20, I'm not the Christ. In verse 23, he says, I need to make the way straight for Jesus. And in verse 26, he says, I baptized with water, but he with the Holy Spirit. And then verse uh, 29 and 30, he said, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. All of John chapter 1 is about John esteeming Jesus. And that's what God wants for our lives. Humble yourself. And he will lift you up. we have any Coldplay fans here in the house? Okay. Yeah. There's like six of us. Okay, come on. You guys are lying. There's some Coldplay. Okay, yeah. Everybody's like, should I raise it or not? I'm a little nervous. I'm going to be prideful. Whatever. Okay. Coldplay. Well, Regina and I saw them a few years ago. They, they're amazing on stage. It's amazing performers and, and all that. Pretty powerful. So they went on their tour this last year, and they didn't come to Denver. Is that so sad or what? They went to every city in the, in, on the planet for 16 months, and they didn't come to Denver. Anyway, I'm not bitter about that. <laughs> they did have another band that toured with them called Wolfgang. Anybody here heard of Wolfgang? No? Anybody got a T-shirt with Wolfgang on that? Or maybe you got a CD in your car, Wolfgang, maybe? You know, you looked at their webpage recently. Anybody? Wolfgang? No, I didn't think so. Nobody goes to a Coldplay concert to hear the warm-up band, Wolfgang. That sounds like the cast of Twilight went on world tour, doesn't it? <laughs> Wolfgang. What kind of name is that? It's kind of creepy, isn't it? Wolfgang this. Wolfgang. 
It'd be weird if you went to the concert and you told the person next to you, hey, man, I'm here to see Wolfgang. And then when Wolfgang finished, you left before Coldplay came onto the stage. That'd be a little awkward, wouldn't it? Most people come late to a concert to miss the opening band so they can see the main act, right? I'm here to see Wolfgang. Guys, we are the opening band for Jesus Christ. He's the star. He's the focus. We are the attendants. We are looking and bringing encouragement and using our platforms and using all that God gives us to point people to the bridegroom and his name is Jesus Christ. In John chapter 3, the final verses of this chapter, the Bible says the Father loves the Son and gives, has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. And see, the beginning place of humility is realizing that we need eternal life. We need Jesus. Humility begins at the cross of Christ. The ultimate act of humility is to bow our knee before Jesus Christ and to cry out to God and to say, God, I know that I have sinned. I pray you would forgive my sins. And I, and I pray that, that, God, that I would humble myself because I want to turn my life over to Jesus. I realize it is not all about me, but I need him in my life. And I wonder how many of us here today need to make that decision, that, that ultimate act of humility, bowing our knee before Jesus Christ and asking him into our lives.